Uh, guten Tag. Glad to have you here after lunch. And um, if there are any questions throughout the presentation, please ask us. Uh, we've we allowed for that during the presentation, and we encourage that. Um, what I'd like to do is to also introduce. Um, these are our objectives, and I'll introduce the, the group here. So the objectives is to introduce the Toyota Kata. Um, and the key is from a developing skills. That's, we want to bring it into the university and use it as a developing skills in the university and explain how Toyota Kata, and you'll see sometimes we use Kata, sometimes we use Toyota Kata, how to bring that into the university. We have two different approaches that we're using. The first is my university, uh, Bainbridge Graduate Institute at Pinchot University. We're a very small university. And then we have Univer University of Michigan, which is very large. And we'll show you that these types of approaches can work at a small university, at a large university. It can work with um, student projects. It can work with projects with, with companies. And uh, we'll give you some real life examples of that. So the overview is, is to talk to you about um, experiential learning learning by doing, we're trying to bring that into the university. Scientific patterns, getting our, man our MBA students and our engineers to be thinking in a different way. But more importantly, we want to get them to learn to coach. We're finding that our students are leaving the university and they don't know how to coach. They think they can manage, but can they coach? So we want to bring that into the university. And then another thing is, do they reflect? Do they reflect at the end of the day what went right, what, what went wrong? So those are the objectives. In addition, let me uh, bring up our group here. And so, again, my name is Dennis Golick, and I'm at uh, Pinchot University, and I'm, I'm the instructor there. And why don't you guys introduce yourself? Okay. Uh, my name is Betty Graytop. I'm from the United States. I work for a company called Zingerman's Mail Order. Uh, a little bit about my background, I was there eight years pre-lean, so eight years professional firefighter, and now uh, <coughs> 10 or 11 years on the lean journey. Uh, hello, I'm Eduardo Lander, and I'm a consultant, uh, now I'm a consultant, uh, do, uh, independent consultant working well, mostly with small companies. Uh, mostly dealing with a uh, high variability, so they have a lot of variability in demand or in the um, um, cycle times of their processes. And the reason I'm involved in this is because I did my PhD at the University of Michigan some eight years ago. And uh, well, anyway, I'm, I work with Singermans as well. So uh, Liker wouldn't, couldn't come to give <laughs> uh, his side of the, of the presentation on, on the classroom side. So I guess I got lucky and I'm here, so. so. Um, hi everyone, my name is Joshua Ma. I'm a graduate student at University of Michigan right now, studying industry and operation engineering. And particularly I take some class with Professor Jeff Likers, who actually gave me the opportunity to come here and take the project with Ingerman also. And before that, I mean I was studying mechanical engineering in China and do a couple of projects in manufacturing and also some investment and management consulting project and uh, I'll graduate next year. That's my previous plan. So, yep, thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. And the reason I wanted to introduce it up front is because um, you'll, you'll see different viewpoints of the same approach. So you'll have the instructor's view, you'll have a student's view of how they view this program, you'll have um, the actual uh, customer's viewpoint, always good to hear the customer's viewpoint. And then uh, Jeff Liker, or um, uh, we're going to hear his viewpoint from a big university with engineering students, and mine are MBA students. So you'll see a lot of different viewpoints on the same subject. Okay, any questions before we get started? All right. So you've seen most of these slides today, or I should say yesterday. These, this is um, from uh, Mike's, some of his presentations online, his slide share. And what I'm going to go through is, is talk to you about the kata, give you those 
five or six slides that give you that background and why we think it's important for our students to get this training and also why it's good for us from a university to teach this way from an experiential way. So a kata, kata as you know is a structured routine that you practice deliberately so its patterns become a habit. Again, a structured routine that you practice so deliberately so it be, pattern becomes a habit. And that's what we want to instill in our, in our students. And we had to devise a way to get this into the program and to get these multiple iterations that, that you'll see. Left side is planning, execution. We have to then devise these projects in a short two or three months so that they can execute, they can learn, they can fail, and they can grow as they go forward. Our students love the visual, visual part. Sure, give me the lean solutions, give me all the tools, I can do the tools all, all day long. It's the less visual ones, learning the mindset behind it, learning that it needs to be a scientific approach. And this is very difficult for our students. They gravitate to the top, they have a difficulty with, with, a, with a bottom part. We can talk about some of the lessons learned from that later on. We talked about again, what it, it, it's a structured approach, but key here, it's through pra practicing. And it's how do we get, bring practicing into a classroom orientation and how do we bring coaching into the organization? So we heard um, uh, Giorgio uh, was talking about high school students, how he brought this into his high school and Arnaldo, you were talking about how you bring it into undergraduates. One of the things that, how we differ from those two programs is that we get our graduate students to actually do the coaching too. So they learn, not only do they learn the practice, not only does the university bring that as a way to teach, but we also teach them how to coach. So that's a very important part. So not only do we do the improvement kata, but we get the students to do the coaching kata. So that's, you know, high school, college, and then the master's part of it. Uh, the classic whack-a-mole, Mike, I love it. This is why st our students love this slide. You know, it's, it's the classic. I'm just gonna choose any, any problem up there and I'm gonna try and solve it. It's not leading me in the direction that I need, but I think I'm doing, I'm working very, very hard at it. We take this and we show the students, no, we need to be a little more structured in our approach. So we need to identify those. You solve one, then you look ahead. You solve that one and you look ahead. All the time going up for the current condition and target condition. Another thing I like to stress that, that we tell our students, the difference between a target and a condition. So who can help me with the difference between target and a condition? One is a point, point solution, the other is a... One is a point solution and one is, is okay, it, that's exactly it. So um, I, I always use the, and this always, the students always get this. They say, okay, I'm a manager. I need us to be profitable. Well, one way I can be profitable and get to be profitable is I can lay off half my staff. Is that gonna lead me in a viable condition going forward? No, so how you get there and what condition you're in matters. And so we, we dif differentiate our students beside, you can get these points all you want, but it's how you get there and hence make that next step to the kata. So that's a very important thing that we, our students have to change their thinking, okay? Does that make sense? So. You'll see, oftentimes you see target and target condition, and we, we always stress from a learning perspective the condition part of it and make sure we get their mindset to be changing in that direction. This is probably, um, and, and Mike came up with this one, is, is slideshow. It's probably been the one that's, that's provided us the most learning um, recently, and it's the current knowledge threshold, that, mine, that line in the middle. And that's very important because beyond this particular point, 
in the horizon. We know how to get there. We can solve the problems going to that point. It's beyond that point that students have a difficulty. Well, what do I do now? And what do students always ask us? Give us a tool, give us a pattern, and I can solve it after that. And we say, there is no tool, there is no pattern. You have to go solve it after that yourself if you have a target condition and you look, but you don't know what's coming up after you. So this has been a very powerful thing from a learning perspective, from our students' perspective. Any questions on this? Okay. And the key is there, we wanna to get to be experimenting and not conjecture. And one of the things from experimenting that we like, that is important for get our students, that we make the distinction between continuous improvement and continuous learning. Because when you continuous learn, that means you can succeed and improve, improve but what's the opposite of succeed? Fail. fail. It's important for you get, to get them, it's okay to fail, what do you learn from it, and then how do you improve coming out of that? And so, that's where the experimenting comes in, and a lot of the students come in aren't used to failing, they don't wanna fail, and we get to, it's okay to fail. That's part of the, uh, the scientific process. We've seen this before, the objectives are certain, I'm the boss, I know which direction to go, and as opposed to, well, we have a plan and let's test it and let's iterate through it. So these are some of the things that we're trying to integrate into uh, the programs and to get the paradigm shift and get into the pedagogy so that we can change how we train, uh, bring the courses to everybody. We use the Toyota Kata and, and later on I'll, ex I'll explain how it fits into our particular course. And I highlighted in red, um, the imp I think the important part, um, the improvement kata, the IK, is a sy systemic scientific way of working through this zone. And then the coaching kata, which we find very powerful, is it's a way for managers to teach the improvement kata. So we want our managers to be leaders, we want them to be managers, but in the future, we're betting that we need our leaders and managers to be coaches. And we're finding that most of them are not very good coaches. That's another way that the kata is a good way for us to bring this into the program. So they leave with this other skill when they leave the program. We see the target condition. Again, what is the challenge? The, the senior boss sets the challenge. Everyone goes off, number two, and they find what is the current condition. We find out what our current condition is. We set our next target condition, and then we find the obstacles and we iterate through that. Okay, we've seen this all before, but it's important to reiterate and go through it. And what we like about this is developing a culture. How do you get our students to go into businesses and how do they get to the point where they can start to change a culture. They think, oh, well, I'm just gonna go in and tell everyone how to do this. Do this, do this, and that changes culture. Uh, obviously, we all know it doesn't work. We know that it takes a long time. So this helps us to change the culture and do it in a way that is then building skills as we go forward. Here's something that um, I bring up, and I get it's a distinction that I make that um, that we use, and I think it's different from a lot of the mainstream. There's a difference in PDCA versus PDSA. And Deming, who is usually um, thought to have brought this up, he, in 1993, he came out, he, he was teaching the Japanese this initial concept back in the 50s, but he actually came up with PDSA in uh, 1993. And the key for our students is there is a big difference from checking something and studying it. And we wanna get our students to begin, getting that reflection to get them to see. But you'll see throughout this, 
difference between PDSA and PDCA. We use them interchangeably, but I just want to make sure that, that you know, we, we use the PDSA because we like the truer form and getting our students to be thinking a certain way. Um, executing phase, um, everyone likes to, to do the plan, but very few of them want to follow through. Again, the coaching helps us get to this executing phase. Let me tell you briefly about a little bit about our university, Bainbridge Graduate Institute at Pinchot University, where the nation's, uh, United States' first all uh, uh, sustainable MBA program. So we take sustainability and we integrate it all the way through each course, through finance, through accounting, through strategy, through marketing. Everything has a sustainability bent. And we've been um, there uh, doing this since uh, 2002. We became a university uh, last year. Um, I've been there the whole time except for the first year. I came on after the first year. And I've uh, introduced the kata after Mike came out with his, his book. I had him come speak to our, our people. We then um, experimented the next year in 2010. We said, okay, let's take three tracks with our students. One is a traditional project. One is using an A3. The other is using the kata practice. And we had three different practices. We measured the students' learning after using a traditional, um, the A3 and the kata. And we found our students learned more and liked using the project approach. So we said, okay, next year, the second year, then we tried just the A3 and the kata, and again, the same results came up that we found that the kata was, through our experimenting, was um, a, a better approach for our students to learn and change a paradigm. So, um, and then now we've, we've been, uh, this is the fifth year that we have kata into our, in our program, and um, it's, it's going well, and it's very well received. Here's another concept that I wanted to bring up. MBM versus MBE, okay? Management by means versus management by ends. And that's where it's something from a sustainability perspective that we're trying to, to get our students that, it, and we talked earlier about condition. It matters how you get there as opposed to just getting there. And if you read the quote, um, Tom Johnson wants, to change the way we're thinking to a learning organization um, that uses approach to reshape the operation in, into creating wealth that fits our finite planet. Um, we heard a talk yesterday that you know we're consuming 1.5 to 2 planets in our lifetime and it's going to go up as the Chinese and the Indians come online with their consuming ability. So getting changing the th way we think is important and we think that applying the kata and lean in general will help us with this overall concept. Here's uh, where we meet. We meet in a, um, uh, a lead building, um, a lead gold building, uh, and we, it's a place that's an open architecture for, for leadership and development from that perspective. Um, our course has divided into four parts. Um, operationally, I give them the operations basics. You know, th these are the, these are the uh, uh, logistics. This is transportation. This is inventory. A quarter of it is that. Uh, another quarter is about lean. Give them the lean principles. So we have the philosophy behind lean, the lean principles. We give them the tools. Then I, we go into another third, another quarter, which is going to be the kata. And then the last quarter is how do we bring sustainability throughout the entire operations management. So we're a little different from your traditional MBA because we're applying these two things, the lean part and the sustainability part. Any questions that you have on this? We can also take them at the end. Any, any questions? Does it make sense how it flows? Okay. Uh, this is a, 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 a one of one course out of a ten course MBA program. The course itself is three months, uh, ten, uh, eleven weeks is what is what we have, and ours is an MBA program. Um, Jeff Likers is a um, master of engineering, and it's a, it's a one quarter type course. Uh, yeah, one, semester, so one semester, which is how many weeks? Uh, three, three months. Yeah. 
three months. Yeah, okay. So with engineers or with MBAs, about one time course. So we had a, um, Bill Constantino helped develop this program. Matter of fact, he developed it and he brought it in. So remember I talked about when we did the experiment between the A3 and um, Toyota Kata. He developed this approach. It's an 11 step approach that we use. I'll go through it real quickly and then we'll give you an example. And it's a really interesting example from a personal standpoint. So there's first five steps and then another 11 steps with the 11th one being reflection. It gets into that PDSA cycle and you go through it and do it again. So each student had to um, choose a project. Um, they could choose a project with an organization and do it jointly in a, a tr the traditional MBA program where you find an organization, you get the data, or they could choose a personal project. We're, we found um, our program versus uh, the engineers, our program was the students opted to do th um, projects that were personal related. Um, with the University of Michigan program, they were business related with teaming up with organizations. The same concept works in both different uh, avenues. So that's, that's an interesting way to, that we looked at it. In this case, we wanted to do something that was easy, but the key was the frequent exposure and to get those short cycle times. And we, we have only 10 weeks, and so we want to get the students to go through these to do the PDSA, 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 to get a number of these. And there's an interesting tool that Bill came up called the glass wall that, um, that we, we will look at, and uh, I, I think it's very effective. So at this point, I'd like to have um, our cards handed out. So two of, the, two of the different tools that we use, the first one is the PDCA cycle, PDSA cycle, and that's, an, that's a very important thing because it's important to make that prediction, and it's important to record it and you get the, the students to make that awareness, and then they start, they start noticing patterns, they start noticing um, major areas that go wrong, deficiency, and those type of things. So you have the, the record, and then the five questions. And we're handing out the five questions. This is something good, I carry this with me all the time. It's good for you to practice and have. You can also find this on Mike's site. Uh, Mike Rother's site, so if you don't have it, if you want to make more copies, you can go out on his site and, and get it. Again, the record is you make, what do you expect to happen? What were the results? You go back, and then how do you reiterate through it? And having this record is, is, is key to the students. The students wanted to rush off and just, oh, I know the solution, and they just tried and solved for it. Well, didn't always work that way, so we, we get them the to get them the structure. Structure is important, and Betty's gonna talk a little bit later about the, how the structure is important and, and how that's important for her people and needing someone to show them the structure there. So those 11 steps, I'm gonna briefly talk, walk you through what one student, this is his, his example um, of what he did and how he used this, this kata to run through this whole approach. So here the, here's the background. Um, he's a resident manager. He lived at this place, so that's how he made his money while I was going to school. It was a 21-unit apartment building in Seattle, where I'm from, and his responsibilities was to keep it clean. Uh, the problem is he was a college student, and college students didn't have that structure. He, had, he was not having the, the uh, luck in keeping it clean, and he was finding that he'd had to rush and, and batch it all on the weekends, and it was just... It was just a mess for his, his life. So he says, I'm going to apply this 11-step this approach and see if it works. So how long should it take? Well, it should take about 15, 20 minutes. So that should a walk through as he goes through the whole property. He goes, walks through, keeps it, sweeps up. He does those type of things. What is the prop process? Okay, he, he preps, he gets ready, he sweeps. The second floor, he sweeps the third floor. Then he comes down to the first. He goes down to the laundry room, goes out to the parking lot, picks up whatever trash is down there. Anything else, he's done, 15 to 20 minutes. But he found out if he didn't do it every day, what happened? 
stuff piled up and on the weekends he'd have to do it, it would take him a lot longer to do it. So that's his current state. What other observations? Well, he kept putting it off. He had to figure out, he had to solve for why was he putting it off. Um, he was forced to do it on weekends. It was taking 30 to 60 minutes a couple times to do it. Um, and he was focused on maintenance and not improving. Again, getting him into using the improvement kata, so not only to, to, to get the current state, but how he can then improve going forward. Were there any ma machines involved? No, not really. He was able to, he didn't have any special machines to clean up the sweep or anything like that, so he was okay on, on as far as this one goes. Was the, st was the process stale, stable within the desired limits? He's trying to get it between 15 and 20 minutes. Obviously, it wasn't stable. So this was the first time that he looked at it. He says, here are all the components, and it varied day by day by day by day. So the data was important, and data was important, but what were the facts behind the data? So that's what we, we, we work with the students. Data is good, facts are better. Okay, why were these things happening? How do you identify data is good, facts are better? And we use the, we, the students this mantra to go slow to go fast. So if you plan and you go through the process, go slow to go fast. Again, they just want to, let me, let me solve it. I know what to do. Well, again, getting them to change their paradigm. So they know that the paradigm's not working. You can see that it's not. And once they start seeing it, they go, okay, now I know what to change. So it's not working. How many operators does it take? Step five, well, it only takes me, so that's one. What are his current condition? He went through and he looked at each one of them separately, sweeping the second floor, third floor, first floor, and found out the amount of time. Then he did his current condition on the left, target condition on the right. There's your gap analysis, and he started to solve for the gap analysis, and he went one by one through the whole process in his iteration efforts. What were his obstacles? Again, th this was a big one is um, his preparation time, he said was mostly waste, but the, the 20, 15 to 20 minute cap sometimes made him miss parts of the process. So he said, do I need that cap or do I just need to start working a little more flexible with it? Here's his cycles, and as I said, this is his record what he expected, what were the results. He went back in, changed it, and he kept making those iterations through it. And over time, as he was going through the process, again, we're, we're talking about a two-month process, he went through and he started to get into this whole process. Now, in addition for him doing this, in the meantime, as the instructor, the first week, two weeks, three weeks for this time. I was his primary coach. So I had, at this time, I had 20 some students. So every week I'm meeting with the students two to three times a week, coaching them on, on their process. In addition, they were in teams of four people. They rotated being their own coach to another people. So after three or four weeks, after I taught them how to be a coach, then I would coach the coach. And that's how they learned to go through the whole process and not only develop the skill of the kata, but start developing the skill of the coach. So it was important for them to go through this process and be a coach so that they can see, oh my gosh, being a coach is a lot harder than you think. These are the questions I have to ask. What do you mean I have to ask open-ended questions? Why can I just say, you know, why aren't you doing this? So. They have to learn the coaching style, and, and Betty will talk about the importance. But this whole run chart was, was an eye-opening thing for them, and then tying that with the coaching kata helped it to become more real to them as they went through. This is the glass wall that I, I, 
I told you about. In the classroom, I had this wall and I also had it virtual, but every week they had to come in and fill this where they were in the process. Green means they're on target, yellow means they were behind, red means there was some serious problem. But this, the transparency got to a point where they were pushing themselves to make sure they, they were keeping up with the project as opposed to, oh, I'll just wait till the last, the last part of the course. So th having this in front of the students, having this glass wall where they recorded, they had to physically go up and record, this is where I am in the process, was very powerful from the whole process. So making them accountable in front of their own peers and using the coaching process to get there. So these are, these are some of his comments. Um, he's having completed several cycles, and he can say that he's proud of his condition now. So his, it, it was a pain in the butt to do it before. Now he's gone through the process, and he's proud of it. Having achieved the stable tack time, it may be time to reassess the target condition. He's learned that, okay, set one target condition. Once you make it, then we set another one. Once you make it, and so they're learning this as they go through. The next step that now is stable is how do I make it consistent in what I do? So these are important things that, that our students are learning. These are reflections. It's a great way to help him meet his objectives. Much of the process was locked into place once I ordered the process the first time and then it was just tweaking it as going forward. And if businesses were to approach this, goals would be a lot more would be achievable. So these are his reflections and these reflect a lot of what the students were saying. But it, it's, it's getting the, the kata process into their project planning and getting the coaching into the process so that they can develop their skills and so that's one of the things that, that we wanted to stress. Um, ref these are the big reflection from this program. Personalized mentoring, rapid feedback, two or three times a week I'm giving them feedback, personal connection with what they wanted to do. They actually had a stake and it was a stake that was meaningful into them instead of go find a company that you don't even know about and just get some data on it. They had s some stake in the game. They developed their own milestones and they had weekly accountability to the students. What questions do you have before we hand it off to Eduardo? Yes. Oh. I was wondering, uh, you were talking about you will learn to coach how to coach a kata yes. to somebody else. Huh? Is the person who is learning the kata still in there or you separate it or the how do you do that? We, we tried it both ways. We found that we have, we have the, the person learning the kata, learning the coach and me coaching. We found we tried it both with the, with the kata, person learning the kata not being there and with them being there. We found that it, it was having them there help them learn so that when it was their turn to coach, they've already seen someone coach, so they, so they know what to expect. So we found it was important and, and powerful to have the kata person and the coaching person there, and then they learn from each other. So for the person who learns the kata, it was not disturbing. I was just... No, no, matter of fact, they, they, they enjoyed having that because they got to reflect on okay, this is what they're going to be asking me. This is what they're going to be coaching me on. So therefore, I better do it. Okay, good question. Thanks, yes, sir. I think it's a cool question. And um, when we started doing this, we thought people would react negatively to conditioning practice. You're treating me like Pavlov's dog, right? And it was exactly the opposite. And uh, what we found was in Japan, um, the mentor doesn't really tell you what you're doing. He just says, just do this. And in 10 years, eventually, you will, you will figure it out. And maybe that plays well in Japan. But what we found in the United States, at least, and in Germany, is that if you say to the people, here's what we're doing. We're deliberately practicing these routines. There's a second coach here to practice the coaching, or coach the coach. And we're doing this. And you might talk a little bit about the brain. You can show some diagrams or whatever and you can relate it to sports practice or music practice. And then we sort of went, okay, here it comes, the resistance because it's conditioning training. 
And the people went, oh, okay, I understand. Let's do that. And I think in the West, we like to know what we're doing. And I think there's nothing secret, nothing hidden, nothing under the table in this process. And we've had no negative reactions. Good question. And, and I, would, I would add on top of that, the, um, you have the extra learning. So not only is there not the res at the first, the re it's not a resistance. At first, they want to be told, just tell me the answer. And when you don't do that, and you say you need to figure it out, they go, okay, it's kind of like a game. I can do that. And then they had fun, and it, but when we tie it to something that was personal or they had stake in, it, they enjoyed it. Or they, uh, it, it was a lot of work, but they, they got a lot more out of it that way. Okay, yes, sir. I'm happy I changed the workshop. I hope we get all these slides. Yes, of course. They're okay, everything thank you. very uh, good. Uh, Dr. May, yeah? My, my 14 year old son, he started about four weeks ago, five weeks ago, uh, to distribute paper once a week. And I believe he's extremely inefficient. I translate your slides and I'll start a project in two weeks from now to optimize his tour. Uh, give it a try. We have many of, many of, the, um, uh, of our MBA students, they take this home and um, We've, we've had, a uh, I've, matter of fact, I've gotten two phone calls. This is the truth. I've gotten two call, phone calls from spouses. They said, they would call me up. What did you do to my spouse? I now have this board in the kitchen, and she's making me do this and record things. And I said, is, do, you, you don't, do you mind? And they go, well, it's helping. And so, but what did you do to her? And so, you know, I've had two, two instances where I, they actually called me, but it, um, yeah, it works in your personal life. So give it a try. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. So next, um, we'll have the University of Michigan experience. And again, larger university, very big university, engineering students, project related with companies. Eduardo? Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. So hello again. Uh, I'm only here really to introduce the the um, experience at the University of Michigan because we have the experts that actually went through it. So Joshua is going to be presenting the uh, student perspective, and then Betty is going to present actually the company side of it. So I'm only going to introduce and give you a, a little bit of the background. Uh, basically, as Dennis was saying, University of Michigan is fairly large. Uh, and uh, it's uh, located in, in Ann Arbor in Michigan. And the course that we're talking about is this one mentioned at the bottom. It's taught in the School of Industrial Engineering uh, by Jeff Liker, who's been studying Lean for the last uh, 30 years or so, and has been teaching a course on Lean for the last 20, but only introduced the Toyota Kata on the, actually this year in the, in the winter semester. And John, John was saying ye uh, yesterday that there's not much going on on Lean at U of M, which is probably true on the curriculum side, but uh, there's a long tradition of Lean there. My, um, John was involved with U of M and, and Mike as well. It still is, Mike, but, um, and, well, and Jeff is there. So anyway, this is the course we're talking about. Uh, the the that's Jeff on the left there. We thought since he was the instructor, we should put a picture of him there. Um, the course itself, uh, there were approximately some, f some 40 students. It was based on interactive le lectures and tours to different companies. So they had games and they had different things going. They had weekly readings and weekly journals covering uh, lean topics. And these journals were also uh, used as, uh, so, so students had to write these journals and they were used as a, uh, as a way of measuring the level of understanding of the students. And Toyota Kata was used as a framework for learning. That was the, uh, the major change that Liker introduced this year. So basically the, the classroom was structured around a project within a company. And the idea was to have a joint effort between university and the companies for mutual learning. So the students get a place to practice what they're learning and to uh, learn by doing, and the company gets exposed to a new uh, and structured way of uh, thinking about continuous improvement. The joint effort is not 
unusual. When I was there, I, I actually, uh, Zingerman's was one of my case studies, so we've been uh, working with, with companies for a long time, but doing it within the framework of Toyota Kata was the, was the new thing. Anyway, the company we're talking about is Singermans, and it's a family of eight uh, companies in Ann Arbor, all dedicated to foods, artisanal foods. Uh, they've been in operation for over 30 years, and they have sales of about $50 million right now between, the, between all of them, and they have about 600 employees. The company in particular we're talking about is the mail order side of it, so only one of the eight. And this one sells foods through mail, basically. They sell uh, products that other Singerman's companies make, as well as products that they select all over the, from all over the world and sell them through the mail. A lot of it coming from Europe, by the way, so a lot of stuff from here. Uh, they have sales of about uh, $16 million, half of it done at Christmas, so they have a huge variability. Two, in the two weeks before Christmas, they do half their yearly sales. So in this period, they go from about 500 orders on a very good day off season to about 7,000 orders uh, per day. And they go from 60 uh, employees, which are not fully loaded off season, to some 400 uh, people. So I just want to give you a little bit of the background of where they are in their lean journey, just to, so you have an idea of where we're introducing the Toyota Kata and what, what kind of setting we're introducing the Toyota Kata. So I started working with them in 2004, and they were a typical example of mass production. So they were having very big batches uh, that resulted in high inventories using a lot of space. In fact, they were changing uh, location every two years because, they, the, because of uh, the two weeks before the holidays, they, they, they didn't have enough space because they, they were producing all these things in advance and they just couldn't, they just couldn't hold them. Uh, they, were, they had unreliable and unstable production, so it was very f hard to figure out what was their capacity and try to predict how many orders they could produce. They, uh, they were const in constant firefighting mode, and Betty mentioned that she was a firefighter for seven years or something. And they had limited improvement uh, processes or capabilities. So they were one of my case studies from 2004 to 2007 when I was studying lean transformation in high variability environments. And right now at 2004, I think we have uh, done uh, quite a lot of progress. Uh, I like the, the, the changes that I like the most are in the mindset more than anything else. But now lean is part of the business as usual. Is uh, They have a lean processes and, and a lean mindset. We have done a lot of uh, improvements, uh, uh, tool base, let's say, uh, mostly on the on the TPS and the just-in-time side of the TPS house, and I will get in in the next slide into a little bit more detail. So I'm not going to talk to those right now, but uh, my, there's always a lot more to do. We're very far from ideal condition. There's always lots to improve. And now we are shifting our way a bit towards the built-in quality side of things and also uh, especially the continuous improvement. And that's what we're here to talk about. So that's where we're going to continue. So very quickly, just to give you a feeling for what they do, uh, basically they ship, uh, they ship uh, packed boxes of food. And they have the main line, they have a line, the yellow here. So they pick products here, they check to make sure that all the orders are, uh, all the products are in the orders. Then uh, there's an assembly, which uh, uh, Joshua is going to talk about. Then uh, packing, they put a UPS label and it goes out the door. So some of the things that we have introduced so far, we are sorting orders at before they're released to level demand and, and workload, actually. Level demand in the markets that are here and also the workload in the stations. And orders are released to tact to be able to control the speed of the line. We have dedicated sales for high volume items. We have uh, items that are prepared just in time, like cheese. This is the cheese room here. Cheese is cut and wrapped to uh, as needed. Uh, we use Kanbans to pull products as needed to the markets using fixed-time routes. Um, sorry. 
We have continuous flow of orders going from one station to the next without any batching. Uh, we have standard operating procedures in all stations to stabilize operations, facilitate training, which is critical for Christmas. When they go from 60 people to 400, they, go, they do that with three days of training per person. So they, the, that is a critical element there. And uh, uh, they also serve as a stepping stone for improvement. And we have an autonomic resource allocation, better known as help your neighbor in Singermans, which is not necessarily in any of the lean tools, but it's a way that has allowed us to try to uh, eliminate the rest of the variability or respond to the remaining variability that we cannot eliminate through the, uh, through the leveling here. So what, uh, what this is, is they have signals and, and rules for when people should move from one station to another. So depending on the workload at the different stations, people shift, shift around uh, autonomically so they, they can decide when to do it. So anyway, that's uh, Singerman's out of glass, mail order. So, so anyway, we, we arrived at this condition through a lot of iterations. Actually, this layout that I just showed you is, uh, if you had gone a year ago, it would have been different. So we have gone through many iterations uh, in the specific processes and also at, at the layout level. So many PDCA cycles learning a bit in each one, not unlike what uh, Toyota Kata is trying to tell us. However, the changes have been top driven, which has been great to move the company in the direction that we want, but now we have a bottleneck because we have a limited number of changes that we can make because well, we only have three managers at the top th that are driving in this. And throughout the years, we have tried many different approaches to try to push down the uh, engagement, to try to engage people and try to put, push down the responsibility for improvement, and we have not been very successful. So last, late last year, we were trying to, we were grappling with this problem of uh, too many things to improve that we have identified that are critical. Basically, their improvement cycle is from year to year. We focus the whole year on improving for the next Christmas because half the sales are happening there. So we have all these improvements I want to do for the next Christmas, and well, now we have a bottleneck and we're not being able to do them all. So uh, we were thinking about introducing the Toyota Kata, and we were actually preparing a plan on how to do it when uh, earlier uh, in January this year, Liker came to us saying that he was introducing the Toyota Kata into a class, and he wanted a project for his students. So the timing couldn't have been per better, so we decided to, to, to do it that way. So we scrapped our plan and went with the students. So, but before we did that, we had to figure out a bit how to do it. So we tried to figure out, well, what, where can we go wrong? What's, what, if, if there's anything that, 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 can, uh, that can derail this? And at Singerman's, we've been doing, uh, we were making changes for the last 10 years, so they are very used to things being one way to today, tomorrow the standard is different and, and, and we change it, so, so there's no problem, people will be receptive to the change, no, no issue there. Strict adherence to an improvement method, they have SOP, so maybe they can do it, but in general the culture at Singerman's is more about flexibility and adaptability and about the people and not so much about strict rules and following everything to the letter. But anyway, we thought, yeah, probably we can do. But coach, not, not really. So there's nobody, nobody in Singerman's knew uh, about Toyota Kata, and the students were learning it for the first time. So where we were going to get the coach? As you know, the recommended approach from Toyota Kata is to have a learner, a coach helping that learner develop the, the, his improvement Kata skills, and then a second coach helping that coach develop his coaching skills. Well, we didn't, we, learners, we had plenty of them, but not so much uh, uh, on the coaching side. So we came up with a bit of a strange structure, which, again, the learner, we have plenty. That, that, that we made the uh, area captains, which is like a team leader for them. So we made those, the learners. But then with the students and the managers, which are the ones that we, well, the students, they ha they, the objective of the classroom was to develop them in both the, learn the improvement kata and the coaching kata. So they had to somehow do both. And also the managers, we wanted them to develop into coaches, but they had never done the, the improvement kata either. So what we decided, okay, these guys will do learning and coaching, 
<laughs> so they were going to be coaching the learner, but they will be doing some of the uh, what things the things that are normally done done by the learner as well. So they were gathering data, they were setting up the boards, they were uh, they were uh, doing the the data collection, running the experiments, and that kind of thing. And then Jeff Liker was sort of a second coach to students, but not on site. So when he, if they had questions and things like that, he would go to them. And I was sort of coaching the managers. Uh, Mike is probably cringing back there, seeing my name up there, but, <laughs> but uh, I was just trying to step ahead, one step ahead of the, of the managers and trying to, to help them uh, a bit there as well. Anyway, this is the structure that we managed to come in to try to run this uh, for the first time, and we did it. And now you're going to hear from Joshua and from Betty what they, what, yeah, go ahead. Oh, microphone. So this two days, we often heard about we need the coaches and huh, abracadabra, they are the coaches. <laughs> um, so the one thing is the, the theoretical context and, and about the lean tools. But what is necessary to make a, uh, a person a coach? Are there some ideas, methods? Maybe leading style, soft skills. So I never heard about that these two days. What is necessary to make a person a coach? I, I can take a stab at it, but we maybe need Mike to to get that. So uh, my, I think one of the things they need to know what they're coaching. So we could have said, okay, these guys are going to be the coaches, but they had never gone through it. So how can they coach on something they have not done? So I think one of the things that they have to know, like if you get a music coach to learn violin, he better play the violin because otherwise, how is he going to tell you that you're holding the bow wrong? So, so I think that's one thing. And then man, you have to, to be able to uh, identify what they're doing wrong. So what uh, they're holding the, the, the bow wrong or they, so, and for that you need a deep knowledge of, of, of that. Yeah. And you need to be able to, I think you need to be able to connect with the, with the person and be able to ask uh, questions that would not tell them the answer, but will guide them somehow to, so that they develop their own, their own answer. How, how, how do you get there? I don't know. I'm sure Mike has a... <laughs> Um, so just real quick, and I can't remember which presentation it was. Uh, Eduardo, do you remember who it was? Uh, this is the kind of a very general structure we use. You're aware of it. This is oh, for yeah. any skill, right? You can do it. And then once you can do it, you can teach it. Okay. And, you know, we've tried hard to find a way to skip the middle box, and we've never found the way. Uh, and it is the catch-22. It is the bottleneck. How do you develop coaches? We have several techniques for sort of getting started. They're artificial structures just so that we can get some practice. Eduardo mentioned a rotation structure where you're a coach and a learner at the same time. But what I would do is say, go to the Improvement Kata Handbook, and there are two chapters on coaching, and it's described in, in great detail there. And it's described in a way that you can use it and take it, and uh, every time we learn something, we put it in the handbook. So it's online Improvement Kata Handbook on the Toyota Kata website, two chapters on coaching. Yes, and there's a German version too that Konstantin <laughs> translated, I believe yourself, right? Okay, you can download it for free at our website, www.cetpm.de. Cool. Any more questions for Eduardo? No. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm waiting for the voice. Okay, cool. Actually, coaching is a good segue to the project as well because essentially the project I'm working on right now, or uh, let me in the thing, man, before we're not to be uh, people do the pro uh, do the assembly by ourselves, but we're actually going to coach people how do they improve their operations. That's why communication and convincing skill become very important. So um, I mean, I actually, as uh, Eduardo mentioned before, I'm coming from Ann Arbor. It's really happy to come here to present my student project. And within Thinkerman, we have three project team actually. And my project team in Assembly 9, which is one of the um, product 9 
a section you will see. So today I'm talking about what is a project and how we define the goal and PDC uh, cycles, and more importantly, what's the results we have. So you're able to see some of the results. Um, so see here, um, which is a part of the bigger map. So assembly line is, is actually only four big stations, and they have two stations in between. So a, a uh, station in total, actually. As you can see here, um, those are the different work cells. So they are pretty close to each other, and they're pretty uh, like crowded because there are so many stuff you have to put in one cells. And for example, here, those are the two boxes that when there's some candy or food coming to the water line, people, the operator actually need to put those things in the, in the box and then put a plastic um, basket and then put it back. So it's a pretty simple uh, operations. However, there is some complexity here because there are different types of products, some big, some small. So how to manage the time become a problem. Okay. And a simple introduction of the team. I mean, I'm one of the people here, and I have two other teammates. Interestingly, none of them are industrial engineering. One is a PhD in aerospace, one is a PhD in material science. And they come to together for this class to learn Ning manufacturing together. And I work with Nisa and Jeffany from Ningerman together. So we're able to build all the projects hand, hand in hand together. It's not um, the command and control uh, model um, in the previous student team, as you can imagine. Um, and for this project, um, first it defined the goals. So when we go there, actually we didn't jump around to the solution part, we tried to define the problem first. So ask the uh, Lingerman team, Lisa and Jeffany, uh, Jennifer, what is the problem in Lingerman right now? And because at the time, because the student project is January to, um, to April, so it's not holiday seasons. So not so many people are there because they have like full-time workers and part-time workers. And when I talked with them, he told me that in the holiday season, in like thanks, uh, in Thanksgiving or um, Christmas, there are so many orders they have to deal with. And it's really hard to make sure they can keep on time because they have so many lost uh, revenue because of that. So th that's how we define the goal to really help them to reduce the effective cycle time, especially in the holiday seasons. And the second goal is that we actually try to involve the Ningerman employees to the Ning manufacturing and PDC uh, improvement cycle together. And for our students, we try to learn how to make impacts to the student project together. Um, so as we talked previously, the difference between target and target conditions, our target condition try to reduce the cycle time to eight seconds by maintaining the eight members in one shift. We don't want to have uh, additional people in this uh, assembly line because already to limited space. Uh, sorry, uh, let's say what the cycle time actually is now, just to look. Oh yeah, 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 to compare, right? Yeah, so you will see the how, what's the actual cycle time right now. So again, because the cycle time is a function of number of people, so you will see how do we convert that. How about three people, how five people, how do we define the appropriate cycle time? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk later, actually it's here. So um, this is a block diagram we're able to plot pretty similar to the actual diagrams. So as you can see here, so average cycle time 22 seconds right now with four people. So, um, and some are full time, some are part time. So basically means some are skilled, some are more skillable. And also there are huge variance from 14 to 32 seconds. Because again, as you can see this on, they're pretty small box and huge box. So the difference is or not, it's something it's hard to uh, mitigate or reduce. Um, a simple operation that we previously talked about, basically you prepare the box, fill the box, and finish the box, close the box. Uh, three simple steps. So when we go there, uh, we have some observation also. The first one that we noticed most operations manually, because it's pretty complex. You have to put the uh, stuff in the right place in the box. It's hard to be replaced by machine. And also, uh, we know that the daily demand varies or not. It may be more than 10 times compared with April with December, which is a uh, holiday season. And the high variation of the cycle time really depends on the type of product, not based on the type, uh, different people, different operators. This is some factor we cannot control. So in this project, we actually define what is controllable, what is non-controllable, and work, work on those non-controllable first. And uh, yep, so how do we deal with those, uh, the difference between the demand the, well, the, the period where we are working on compared to the high holiday season. Uh, actually, we assume that all the projects we apply here, for example, let's see, I save 10% cycle time, and this result is scalable in the holiday season. This is our assumption. However, we can talk more how do we, how's the next step to evaluate that assumption. 
And we also realize there's no specific when the operations or the machine update needed in these operations. So the challenge, as we mentioned, is how to reduce the cycle time. And so we're able to convert the cycle time in how about three people, how five people, what is the appropriate time we should target. And all our and like PDC cycle data on, we target that as a goal. We're able to evaluate whether we achieve or not achieve this goal. Uh, okay. And also, uh, we noticed that we can invest like million of dollars to improve the line, but our project is that we don't want to have any additional investment how to improve that organically. Okay, this is the first um, PDC cycle, actually. So when we first go there, we notice that there is a screen, which is by the computer, remind people how much time they use in the uh, putting the box and finish the box. However, there's no time between orders. So for example, uh, if I finish one order, there's no time, like, t let me know how much time I use, I spend before I co uh, make, uh, continue the next one. That's why we use actually a simple reminding system, remind the worker that, okay, you use 50 second, 30 second time in between two orders. And the, the operation is pretty simple. However, yeah, as you can see, the results is actually around 9% nine, 9 improvement on the cycle time. And we're able, as you can see, test one is before we implement the time of, uh, reminding system. Test two is after that. So, um, there, so the incremental increase in 9%, as we mentioned. However, there is uh, also reduced in the variance as well. So people actually become more effective by having the time awareness there. However, we don't want people ha ha have too much pressure as well. So actually, we also talk with people like what would be the proper way for remind. We don't want to be a, a huge alarm like to remind people. People are like pretty uh, mild and pretty simple remind system. So that's the uh, PDC one. The second one is that when we go to do the like time study, we realize that when, uh, as you can see, the test one, which is the original one, when people actually take some like, we call jazz uh, jazz pack, which is like the material fill the box, they use a lot of time in the beginning because they are so tight with each other, and use a human hand, it's really hard to take it off, and also not safe as well. So the second. Uh, like improvement in that, how can we improve that process by putting some tools so people don't use hand to take those material, but use some tools. And the, the improvement is huge. Um, so the average, the results on average is 10% increase. And however, we notice that there, there may be some, uh, oh, and also um, taking the jet pack is also one operation, and also they reduce the overall like, time by 10% also. So it's also a huge impact. And we are able to do over 12 different cycles to test that. And it's actually not the uh, finished point. When we go back to the results, we realize that the first three results for the test one is so high. The reason why, because when the first new box of JSPAC come to the um, assembly line, people actually spend time to like, try to lose the, uh, the material together. It's actually the problem here. And, and one tool, one approach could be having a tool. Another approach could be have some new material, which is loose by itself. So people don't have to lose itself in the operations. And we're happy to know that actually Zinkerman right now already implement a uh, buy a new material, to, which is easy to handle. Um, and by having those two uh, PDC, we still have more time. That's why we kind of look back to the system to see what is the time which is uh, recorded in the original computers. And you can see, again, so we know that the cycle time depends on the type of orders. And there are major uh, A to F, different type of uh, goods. And for each one, the system has its original design of different time, which operator should able to finish. However, we we'll realize that the time itself is outdated. When we compare the actual operation time versus the computer time, there's a huge difference. So we're able to, we're not, we don't calculate the time ourselves and tell worker operator to do it. Actually, we de develop a time with the worker uh, together, see what will be the appropriate time you can finish that without uh, too much rushing. Um, so the time itself, the system is still implemented while we finish the project, and we estimate that it can increase 11% in cycle time. So the, the previous three um, PDC cycle is pretty quantitative, uh, can be measured uh, quantitatively. The last one is more about how do we improve the system overall. Uh, when we when, when we are in the uh, production line, we, we realize there's one incident that the printer actually broken. 
Uh, we don't know how much, uh, how frequent that can happen, but we think that may be a problem in this system as well because there's no feedback system. Like the operator cannot tell the manager, okay, the printer broken, can we replace one? Because that's, that's expensive. And there's no data to support the beneficial to replace another machine. That's why we create this simple error checklist for the, op uh, for the uh, operators. So they can record what happened in their daily operation. And by a certain amount, maybe monthly, weekly, they can report and record that to the manager. People can know, okay, maybe the machine or paper uh, printing machine, we really, really, we really need to replace that because it had broken multiple times for the past weeks. So these are pretty easy tools. And actually, we use that to empower the worker as well because they are able to provide one more feedback to their managers. So as a summary, all four different PDSA cycles contribute to the reduce of the cycle time. And overall, mostly it reduces the time between orders and also the time to fill the bulk with JSPAC. And more importantly, um, as a student team, we know that after the project, as I, as I mentioned, like not everyone is industrial engineering. We may not do lean manufacturing in the future. However, this type of improvement, continued improvement, and kata, kata approach really beneficial for our career as well. No matter where to finance strategy, no matter which career we choose to go. So I do have some takeaway from a student standpoint. Um, and and I, I think Patty was going to share more about the Lingerman standpoint. So the first one that when we first go to the uh, Lingerman, we realize there's strong uh, support from leadership. So also the owners and also the manager talk with us privately about their vision of Lingerman and how our project can help them. So in the be beginning, we feel like we are important to the organization and we can do something there. And secondly, some of the approach is pretty tough. Like we have, I, don't know, I know nothing about how to program the time system, but we try to make it fun because we know that by improving the time we have, we can make the worker I'll put more effectively, and they can go home early, and they can take care of their cho children, which is at least Lisa told me. Um, and also, we're able to focus on the problem uh, 2080, because in the uh, optical, uh, optical we identified in the beginning, there are also other problems which is important, but we know something is pretty more long-term, something is short-term. So we're able to focus on those 80 out of 100, uh, 20 out of those 100, um, problems which is easy to implement and, and can be implemented in a short time. And also, um, three of our team, we have found diff different discipline. So three of student team actually will help each other try to learn different cut approach, different lean manufacturing ideas, because we are not perfect in the knowledge base. This is also one of pretty important things, because when we compare other student team, we do realize that there are some student dynamic problem which may cause the effectiveness of the project. And lastly, um, so there are many toolbox in lean manufacturing, and, but all those toolbox have some assumption and some philosophy behind it. So when we try to learn different kata approach, at least Professor Jeff Nacker told me, don't take the face value, try to think more, reflect more, how you can apply that in your project. For example, we talk about PDC cycle, right? But maybe once we see the results, because of time limit, we may not finish all the cycle together. Maybe we can teach people how to do the, finish the other, another like COA after our project. So we are able to utilize our time more effectively. So we're able to be more flexible while follow, following the, the principle philosophy of the lean improvement. Um, so that's my uh, thinking and my, my project. Thank you. And I pass to Bitty. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Joshua. Oh, geez, here I am. I got to say, if somebody had told me 18 months ago or so that I'd be standing in Stuttgart, Germany, presenting at a lean conference with professors and consultants and whatnot, I, yeah, not so much coming from Zingerman's, but I'm going to give it my best shot here. So um, as has been mentioned, we had three teams of students come join us this last summer. So I've been doing this since maybe April. You know, maybe, that was, maybe it was January, it doesn't matter. Um, when Dr. Liker proposed the fact that we could have three student groups come and help us uh, learn the kata. Um, so we've been doing lean for about 10 years. One of our biggest internal problems is that we are really, really, really good and really fast at fixing our own internal mistakes. So for many years, it was just about fixing it, get it back on the line, get it out the door, because that's all the hat, that's that firefighting mode that we were in. So when this was proposed that we could have a yet another attempt at some sort of root cause analysis, we 
we gravitated toward. So that's actually how I ended up standing here. So I'm going to try to talk to you a bit about um, the three projects, the different structures, just because when you have human interactions with people, each group was different. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit through that. Uh, the benefits and the current condition, future activities, that's our crew. Yay. I told them I wasn't going to go to Stuttgart without them. <laughs> um, so we had three teams. We had our PIC Cata, which their focus was on quality, the assembly team uh, Joshua just spoke on, and our packaging team, which the focus there was on productivity. Okay, so the PIC Cata team. The challenge that they chose or that we gave to them um, was to reduce the amount of instances that are an internal mistake called didn't reach, the number of instances in which that happens. So basically that's the order going down the line, the picker forgets to pick it, it gets to quality control, it gets kicked out. We fix it real fast and pretty much that was the end of our journey as it, as it comes to mistakes. Um, through Eduardo, we've learned that we want to fix mistakes three ways. We want to fix it for, the, for that order, for the day, and then forever. We're really good at the first, eh, smidge okay at the second, and we suck at the third. So again, that is why that we uh, are trying to introduce the kata to um, our team members here. And also because, as Eduardo mentioned, I am now the bottleneck. Me and my two managers are the people that, that pretty much drive the improvements, and there's just way more going on than we could possibly keep up with. So the pick kata was about didn't reach, and here's the experience of our pick kata team. Um, so it was three students from the engineer st uh, school, one manager and one frontline captain or supervisor. Um, they had the strictest adherence to the kata of our three groups. They were consistent. They were to the T. They, they, they didn't try to do B before A. Um, they were able to define their current condition. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about in another slide about where we had a situation where we couldn't define our current condition. The students were willing to work at the workstations. So, you know, Zingerman's is a very friendly, kind of laid back place. Um, we don't like to have people come in and tell us what to do. I'm sure most people don't. Uh, the students on this team came in. They wanted to read the SOP. They wanted to present it to the captain. They wanted the captain to present it to them. They wanted to spend a shift working on the pick line. So that provided a lot of buy-in from uh, the Zingerman's employees. And it resulted in pro positive improvements. Uh, they saw a reduction in the number of occurrences through their different iterations of PDCA. Um, and then when the students left, uh, well, one thing first, they left an improvement structure in place. So these folks left us a kata board that now even if I'm at another part of the warehouse and I have a question, I run over to that kata board and go, oh, okay, God, that's how they did it, and run back over. Should make a Xerox copy, it'd be easier. Uh, but um, so they left a, a structure in place for us. When they left, I got I'll be honest, we sort of backslide a little bit. Um, and the manager that was running this team got busy, and we saw a reoccurrence of our didn't reach uh, mistakes go back up. They picked the kata back up, and it's now back to where it was when the when the students first left us. So that was the experience with the pick kata. Let's see. Uh, assembly kata, this is what Joshua just uh, presented upon, had a, a similar structure as our first group. They followed the kata um, to the T. They struggled to define the current condition. I'm going to talk about that a little more in the next slide. The students were willing to work at the station and it resulted in positive improvements. Let's see. The packaging kata. Uh, this was the team that I was working on, which is, is a little sad to say that it was the least least best run team. It wasn't run well. It was run well. We didn't, get, we didn't end up where we wanted to be um, for a couple different reasons. In this particular situation, we were unable to define our current condition. So one of the, the important steps of the kata is grasping the current condition. We cannot grasp our holiday condition in May. In May, we have two people packing as opposed to the 20 people pack, 20 new people packing in December. So there's two big things that Eduardo had spoke of. We have the variability not only in demand, we have the variability in the training of the people, and then just in the mix of the orders. Um, on a regular day, the gift box, the assembly ratio to the other orders uh, may be maybe 12, 15%. This time of year during the holiday, it's 50%. So every other order is an assembly order. Um, 
So we were unable to, to define our current condition, which I believe led us to jumping to experimentation. I kept trying to wrangle the, the engineer students and say, I, I, don't think, I don't believe that we've defined the current condition. I don't believe that we've find, defined the current condition. And they'd say, oh, but if we just create flow and pack, we'll be fine. We're going to do this, this, and this. And you know, we'd try an experiment, and I'd go back and I'd say, I don't believe that we've defined the current condition. And uh, you know, at some point, you just go, OK, we're going to do another experiment. And we did. So we didn't follow the kata. We didn't define the current condition. Uh, the students were not willing to work in the workstation. They were not willing to learn how to pack a box. Um, this did not go well with the people working in the area. And they were very polite and kind, but they weren't, they weren't bought in at all. Um, and it resulted in rework. After the students left, we restarted this kata. Where this one is currently at is that we believe we have defined our current condition. Um, and that we believe that the uh, discrepancy that we see between our holiday and, and our regular or off season is more about the training of the holiday of the holiday staff person. So, so benefits of the student run kata. Uh, we get fresh eyes on old and new problems. Um, the old problems that I, I don't even see anymore. They're so common. I'm used to them. Everybody, you know, you just get comfortable. Uh, and the new ones that I don't even, I don't even know, I don't know. Uh, we get new voices delivering the same consistent kata message. Uh, one of my bosses is fond of saying you need to hear something 27 times before it actually kind of sinks in. So the more people that we can get there helping us go through this recipe. Uh, we, we refer to it as a recipe because we're a food industry or a food business. Everything in our business is a recipe. It, it, uh, we learn from all the groups regardless of, of whether the actual kata was run well or not. I learned just, I learned probably more from it, I, wouldn't wanna, I don't want to use the word fail, but it failed, um, than I did the other two groups. It definitely keeps us on the path of continuous improvement. When you have engineer students showing up at your business ready to engage you, you're going to be ready. The students are generally very high motivate, highly motivated, and they're wicked good at Excel. <laughs> I learned more about Excel in the last four months from an engineer student than uh, most of my time at work. And uh, the short time commitment is incredibly beneficial to us. Not only does it let us rotate through the captains and, and try to pinpoint who is going to be good at this type of work, because not everybody is good at it. I mean, you get some folks in there that they're, they're going to try really hard. They may not just be uh, mentally inept at, at doing this type of work. It's much easier to have a, a project end than it is to tell somebody that you have to take them off a project. So because the students are there for three months, uh, it helps us in, in that respect as well. It also helps us guide to the right size challenges. Because we're new, we don't want a challenge that's really big and lofty. We're looking for something that's more bite size. And it helps with that. So. Cool. Current condition and future activities. So uh, we had the pack, the assembly, and the pick kata. Currently, the out of market kata, OOM. This is our biggest internal mistake. And we started this a few weeks back. We're following the recipe strictly. We just recently started having the coach learner meetings where. Uh, the kata was introduced, and you know this particular gentleman, we needed to get him up to speed on how to do graphs and data collection, things of that nature. But it's uh, currently up and running, and I'm very excited about it. The other, um, the other thing with this one, we're currently only meeting once a week, actually, with most, which I know is not good, and that we want it. We're striving to get to the daily, the daily follow-up, the daily check-in. So uh, we will get there one day. And this is our routes kata. This is kind of a, we, we're referring to it as the sneaky kata, only because we were standing around having our, our it was a, week, a, a routes meeting, and there was five or six guys and myself and one other manager. And we realized we were kind of asking the questions of the kata, but we didn't have a storyboard. We did, they didn't know we were doing the kata. What, and we thought, we're getting some traction here. Like, what, what happens if we don't make it formal? What happens if we just continue to ask the questions? continue to show up and uh, from behind the scenes try to sort of drive this. So I, I don't know honestly where this is going. I'm not even sure it's a good idea, but it is what we're trying right now. It's an experiment that we're running. Um, and it, like I said, it's yielding positive results. So it's pretty cool. 
And that has been my experience with the three teams in the katas this summer. So, thank you. 13 minutes. Hey guys, come on up, come on up. So, be respectful of your time. We have about five minutes left, but we want to go through what are some of the obstacles and what are some of the experiments that we're going to be doing in the future? And each one of us has a different perspective. So if, if we could give us a couple minutes, we'd like to go through these. Um, first one is work. We want to get our students to be thinking, working towards just enough. And, and that's something that we've been trying to work with our students from a, a continuous improvement perspective from a lean perspective, getting them in their idea of what does that mean? And we've been using this for four or five years, and it's still something that's it's hard for them to grasp, but we're, we're working towards that. Um, we also are looking for, and this is a challenge for a lot of you, we want to share what we've done here, and so we're open. Um, the four of us, we came over because we want to support this, this first um, ELEC here, and we're willing to share anything that we can with you. So anyone who's willing to give us a call, we'll, we'll share our data, we'll talk to you about our, our, our what went well, what didn't well, work well, those type of things. Then we, we get into some of the learnings from... More practice. I need practice, 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 practice. I am not a um, regimented person by nature. Luckily, my one colleague is incredibly structured, so I kind of follow his lead. But I know that the more I practice, the better I'll get at this. Uh, improve problem-solving abilities together. I don't think enough, I, enough can be said for the relationships that um, we build on the warehouse floor when I'm out there uh, working, whether it's kata or PDCA or, or whatever we're doing that day. Um, it's just the interaction of person-to-person -person problem-solving together. Also, I had grow to be a better teacher and coach. But. So my, the, the next two actually are, uh, I, I discussed with Liker what he's going to do nec different in the next class. So he's going to try to integrate the, the CATA even further into the class. So right now it was the main project, but it was not, uh, from the classroom perspective, it was not well integrated. He was asking the students to present twice during the semester about what they were doing. And now he's actually going to uh, structure the whole class around the project. So they're going to be uh, coming, um, uh, first of all, they're going to be presenting much more often uh, about what they're doing. Uh, one of the things that we observed was that they worked a lot the two weeks before the first presentation and two weeks <laughs> before the, the last presentation, where in between there was some, some teams that didn't even show up, not yours, of course. <laughs> but uh, but so, so he wants to integrate it a lot more uh, to the class and also link better the tools of lean that he's teaching to the work that the students are doing, uh, should be doing uh, with the in, in the class. Um, that also goes in hand with evaluating progress more often. So instead of having two big presentations, have one every week or something. And uh, the last one, the, uh, the well, the next time we run uh, Kata projects in Zingerman's, now we will have some experienced coaches, so we won't have that weird structure <laughs> that we had uh, there of coaches, teachers. So at least, uh, well, for the students maybe, but at least we'll have some experienced coaches from from the business side. So, yep. I have one point which is not here, but so based on after our project, we're happy with the results. But we also know that there are some project team which may not achieve the original goals. That's why in the, uh, we are thinking the next step will be increasing more the sharing of knowledge between student teams. Because even though Kata approach is pretty standardized, we know the toolbox, but however, there are so many unknown, uh, unknown, unknown there as well. So how to increase the communication between student team, like the way they communicate with the manager in the factory, operating the factory, and how do they manage their internal leadership team dynamic. Those are the lessons which we can discuss as a team and also get support from professors as well. So, Thank you for having us here and look forward to you guys uh, to creating a successful one next year. Doctor? Okay, now give them a big applause. And now...
I think they're open to your questions, so you could start right now. Uh, thanks for your presentation, very inspiring. Um, I was thinking we are working with the integration of gamification within the Toyota Kata and therefore we're thinking in levels. And I was thinking about your uh, case. We're uh, experimenting with a level of intensity, strictness from the Kata rules. So each level it changes. Mm. Do you think the Kata in the beginning with your case slow down your improvement process? The structure of the kata. You using, using the, the kata. kata? No, no. Uh, I think that um, we would have had to use something, whether it was kata or PDCA. We would have been following some structure. So I think the structure itself definitely slows us down. I don't think the kata structure slows us down. Okay. That makes sense. But the team was willing to improve. Yes. As I, as I understood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Looking forward to the games. Thank you for the presentation, it was very, very interesting. Um, I was wondering how did the teams and the process operators um, dealt with the um, sort of when, when the experiments didn't yield the expected results? Because I think that's very important that people become comfortable with failure in essence, that mm -hmm. experiments may not always yield the expected results. Where was there frustration or, or how, how, was the, how, did they, how did they deal with that? No, no, no. We have, uh, um, I have the luxury of working at Zingerman's, which comes with, with uh, the culture was almost in place, it was in place before I even got there. We had the groundwork of lean culture before lean was lean. So it's okay to make a mistake. You know, it's okay to ask for help. Uh, it's okay. The only thing it's not okay to do is not what you say. But yeah, so no. Yeah, maybe add on that. So um, actually about the success and failure, right? Actually in my project, there is some uh, failure in the beginning because as we mentioned, when we, tried to, when we tried to define the current state, we actually failed to define that because we don't know what's a, what will be changed in the holiday season compared with this off seasons. And we're able to communicate with the worker like one-on-one, -on -one, how do we define that? What will be the changing criteria or factor? And we're able to control that. And also, when we notice there are some maybe the funeral or their door open, there's definitely something open for you. So always be po uh, like optimistic. This is something the something we share with Ingerman together, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. It's time for the break now. Give them applause again. <laughs> thank you very much.